All right, folks, stick around. We've got something really exciting coming up. We've got Rachel Toback up next here on the stage. For those of you who don't know Rachel, she's a hacker and the CEO of Social Proof of, and Social Proof Security, where she helps people and companies keep their data safe by training and pen testing them on social engineering risks. Rachel was also the second place winner of DEF CON's Wild Spectator Sport. The Social Engineering Captured the Flag contest three years in a row. I guarantee you, you're going to have a ton of fun. You know, stay here, and she's going to be talking about the uh, the fishing contest that we had at Arma Blocks. Joining her, uh, please, Rachel, come on stage. Thank you. Put your hands together for Rachel, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. And joining Rachel is going to be uh, Brian Johnson. And a quick introduction to Brian. Brian Johnson currently is the CISO at Arma Blocks, and prior to this, Brian was a CISO at Upwork, a lending club, and was one of the uh, principal architects of the, the Netflix security program. Uh, please put your hands together for Brian Johnson as well. Hey, Brian. Thank you, sir. What's up? Right. How you doing? How you doing? Um, so we are going to announce the winners of winners. the winning competition at the end. Do you want to come back up and join me at the end? At the end, absolutely. That sound good? We'll right All right, I'll call you back. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining me here today. It looks great. My name is Rachel Toback. I'm a hacker. So who here is a hacker? Would identify as a hacker in the audience here today? We got a few hackers. Who's been to DEF CON, the world's largest hacker conference? All right. If you've been to DEF CON, I would classify you as some sort of hacker. So let's jump into our talk today. We're going to be talking about how we hack, how I actually dive into the mind of an attacker, what I do when I am hacking, what it looks like, and how you can avoid falling for my tricks. At the end of today, we will be announcing the $500 grand prize winners for the Armor Blocks contest. So let's jump into it. First and foremost, who am I? As I mentioned, I'm Rachel Toback. And if you're curious about how I got my start in social engineering, this is it. The world's largest hacker conference, DEF CON. There's the social engineering capture the flag. Who has seen the SECTF social engineering capture the flag? Awesome. Okay. So what happens in this is you get into a glass booth in front of an audience of about 500 people, and you have to hack a real life company target live in front of that audience in 20 minutes. It's an extremely sweaty experience. It's very fun. I ended up getting second place in this competition three years in a row, very consistent. You know, we don't need to go for first. Second's good enough. Thank you. Thank you. And that's how I got my start in social engineering. So let's jump into the stats. What do we know about social engineering? What are we seeing? So as we talked about today, there are the not the greatest stats in the entire world. We're seeing that social engineering is increasing throughout the pandemic. We're seeing quite a bit of stress for folks, employees uh, throughout the pandemic. And we know from the uh, research done um, by both Proofpoint and Google that phishing has increased pretty much exponentially during the pandemic. So we know from Google's transparency report, there's a 350% increase why would that potentially be? Hacking has always been a thing, so to speak. We have always seen phishing. Why would it increase during the pandemic? We believe this is because these criminals had access to legit jobs, which they lost during the pandemic. So they had to turn more to a life of crime. And we know that a lot of this includes ransomware. The interest is in money, right? 78% of organizations saw some sort of email-based ransomware attack in 2021. And we know this from Proofpoint's research. So let's jump right into how are hackers thinking? When I'm sitting down at my computer and I'm gonna craft the best phishing attack possible, what's going on in my brain? So first and foremost, if you wanna find the attackers that you're gonna find most frequently in your inbox, I want you to follow the fear. So what do I mean by that? You have to ask yourself, what keeps us up at night? And that's different for everybody, for yourself individually, for your family, for your friends, for your coworkers. And every different teammate has something different that stresses them out. So it might be things like COVID-19 access to vaccines, booster, exposure notifications. It might be public health guideline changes or guideline changes at work. Do I have to wear my mask now? Do I need a new booster, et cetera? And right now, 
we're seeing quite a bit of donation scams. You can probably imagine, because of what's going on in Ukraine, the attackers are taking advantage of that. Now, when I'm hacking, I'm an ethical hacker. I do not use fear-based pretexts. I do not pretend to be someone who's looking for a donation. That stuff's horrible. So what do I do instead? I educate on that horrible, unethical stuff, and I talk about, you know, what does it look like? How do we avoid it? The actual hacks that I'm doing are pretty much reward-based. Hey, do you want a free donut? Are you interested in a holiday gift for your company, et cetera? Just to kind of prove how it works so people get a good example without harming folks. But not all attackers are lazy. Some attackers leverage principles of persuasion to convince you to do things that you wouldn't normally do. But why would we fall for these principles of persuasion if we know that a hack is coming? The reason why we fall for this stuff, even when we know it's coming down the pipeline, even though we know we're going to get a scam in our inbox at some point, is because of these principles of persuasion that we cannot switch off. It is innate in all of us as a human being. Who here has read Robert Cialdini's book, Influence? Anybody? Yes, okay. So this book, Influence, is going to be telling you everything you need to know about the principles of persuasion and how they relate to psychology. Way back in the day, I actually have a degree in neuroscience, used to work in a rat lab. That's what I did way prior to being a hacker. That's a totally different story, though. I'm going to be relating it to both hacking and neuroscience to give you a deep dive into how I'm thinking when I'm building my attacks. So we're going to go through the principles of persuasion here, starting with reciprocity. And then I'm going to show you a video of me actually leveraging them live to hack a CNN reporter named Doni. And I want you to really think about the principles of persuasion and how they relate to your life, because I will be giving out challenge coin prizes if you can figure out what you see in the video. Ooh, ah, it's going to be fun. So first, we have reciprocity. This is all about our our hardwiredness to be, you know, feeling indebted to somebody. If we give information to somebody else about ourselves, they're more likely to tell something to us about themselves. So let's say I wanted to hack DJ. I'm just going to pull a random person out of a hat, right? And I'm like, DJ, I need to figure out which operating system and version DJ is running so I can tailor my malware to work on DJ's computer. So what, what, what am I going to say? I have to figure out some pretext that's going to work. I might say something like, hey, DJ, I'm trying to get my talk link to work. I'm not sure why it's not working, what's going on here. It might be because I'm on a Mac and I wrote this deck on Windows. I honestly don't know. And I'm bad at computers. Who knows, right? Throw something in there to make them feel bad about you, right? And then DJ might say, well, honestly, Rachel, I'm, I'm on Windows 10 right now. I don't know if I can help you. Let me see if I can grab somebody who can support you. That little information about what I'm on, this Mac, and that I used a Windows machine to build it, and hopefully that's enough detail to get DJ to tell me the information about his machine so that I can tailor my malware. Then we have commitment and consistency. We have to make thousands of choices every single day. Our brains need to take shortcuts, otherwise we wouldn't be able to get our work done. So with commitment and consistency, we try and get you up the yes ladder, so to speak. If I can get you to say yes early on in a conversation with me, we're talking about COVID traffic, your parents, your dog, et cetera, that we both have chihuahuas, whatever, right? Further down the line, it makes it more likely that you will be committed and consistent to the choice that you are going to trust me. And it makes it more likely that you'll comply with any requests that I have. Then we have social proof. Social proof is all about name dropping. Have you ever experienced someone really name dropping someone to you and you just instantly go, I have my guard up? Right? I don't know why, but for whatever reason, I can't trust it. And that is because of social proof. We're very smart. Our brains know, even if we're not trained to look for it, I am nervous that someone is name dropping to try and build trust with me. So what do I do when I'm hacking? I might say, let's say I know DJ and Anon work together, and I need to hack Anon. I might say, hey, uh, DJ, I just got everything set up over here. This is Allison over in IT. Um, I just worked with Anon. It took like two seconds to get everything updated with the migration. Can you go ahead and check that out real quick? I just sent it to you over email, pairing together that phone call with that email. And if, it, if it, those two people work together, and I can find that on LinkedIn in five, 30 seconds, right? Then it's more likely that if I name drop a coworker to that individual, that person will probably click. Because if they're like, oh, if Anon did it, then it's got to be trustworthy, right? We leverage the trust transference between the two people who work together in the office. Then we have liking. 
This one's pretty obvious. We trust people that we like. We like people that do things that are similar to us. These two people are mimicking each other's hand motions. This is something that we do with our mirror neurons in our brain. It's natural. We actually can't switch it off. You've probably noticed that if somebody uses a lot of emojis or exclamation points in an email or Slack with you, that you're more likely to be a little more exuberant. Or if they're pretty deadpan and they're not actually giving you a lot of energy, you might tone it down a little bit because you don't want to seem like too much, right? This is natural for us in our communication. But when I'm hacking, the way that I do it is not natural. I go out of my way to look up how do you speak, what phrases do you use, finding videos of you on Instagram, Snapchat, YouTube, what's the cadence and volume of your voice, so I can match you, so that you like me more, so that you trust me more. Then we have authority, another one that's pretty seemingly obvious. We trust people who have the authority to tell us what to do. Oftentimes, I'll pretend to be your boss's boss's boss when I'm hacking you, but sometimes I will flip the principle of authority on its head. I'll pretend to be somebody who has no authority at your company, a brand new individual, an intern, someone who's junior to you. And I might say, hey, I'm really not sure where I'm supposed to go. Can you send me the all hands deck or the wiki or what am I supposed to be doing right now? Hoping that I can get leverage, some information from you, giving you the authority to tell me what to do. And I have none. This does work for me pretty frequently. I will say though, most frequently, I will try and be your boss's boss's boss, because that's a pretty sure way to do it. Then we have scarcity, urgency. Imagine if you receive a phone call. It's very loud. I'm playing the sound of an airplane taking off in the background on YouTube when I call you. And I'm like, hey, I am so sorry. I'm trying to figure out why um, my talk link isn't working before I get there tomorrow. And you're like, I cannot hear you. What's going on? And I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm sitting on the runway right now. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? It's, it's www.maliciousurl.com. Can you make sure it works? Please, DJ, I, I really have to go take care of my parents. I'm so sorry, this is last minute. And you're thinking, what is going on here? This is the crazy, this is so weird. I've never heard anything like this. This specific type of attack, where I try and catch somebody off guard, play a loud noise in the background, call them, couple that with a phishing attack, it works for me 50% of the time. That sounds ridiculous, right? 50% of the time, I play the sound of an airplane taking off in the background and I can get someone to click a malicious link within five seconds. It sounds ridiculous. But if someone's trying to get you to speed up and do something quickly, that's a super good indicator that you're about to get hacked. There are very few indications in life where we have to do something within five seconds. Very, very few. It happens, but very few things are life and death. So how we communicate that back to our teams that if someone's trying to speed you up, we have to pump the brakes is essential. And a lot of times just showing them how it works, showing them a free YouTube video, which you're about to see, can be really, really useful for them understanding that. And we combine all of these principles of persuasion that I just talked about together with pretexts, who we are pretending to be. And a pretext is personal for each person. So I really develop it. If you're in customer support, it's gonna be different than if you're in finance. And I wanna walk through what it looked like when I developed pretexts for Donio Sullivan. He reached out to me and he said, Rachel, if I give you no information, can you hack me? What can you do? What can you find? And I said, well, I don't know, maybe I could kick you out of your house, reroute your packages, uh, change your healthcare, SIM swap you, steal your crypto. What do you want me to do? And he's like, well, none of that. And ultimately we decided on something that felt appropriate. He didn't know what was gonna happen, but he did know he was gonna get hacked. So he spent his time anxious, nervous. The folks over at CNN were reviewing the contract, like, is this gonna affect us negatively? No, it's not, just don't he? And he didn't know what to expect. He's avoiding emails, he's not picking up his phone. But little did he know, I would never once contact Dhoni during these attacks. And this is because there are two ways that I hack. Either I hack you by contacting you directly, or I hack you by contacting the services you trust directly, as you or somebody else in your family. In fact, this type of attack is increasing. And we know there was a 100, uh, 117 something percent increase um, in vishing calls between 2016 and 2017 to call centers for fraud. 
And you might be thinking, okay, this is kind of an old statistic. What's the new stat? The truth is there is no new stat. This type of research is extremely rare. This is the only research of its kind from pin drop. And so we actually don't know the incident rate of these types of attacks. But I do them every single week, so I can tell you a little bit more inside baseball about how they work. So what information did I need to be able to hack Dhoni? This is it. Kind of a short list. Name, address, birthday, email addresses, and phone numbers. That's pretty much it. And you might be thinking, OK, well, Rachel, I don't post my phone number on the internet for all to see. I'm not broadcasting my email address. And hopefully you're not doing all of that stuff, but some people do. You might not be, but a data brokerage site might be doing that on your behalf. If you've ever Googled yourself and you saw my life, peak you, all of these data brokerage sites pop up with your address, your full name, your addresses from the past 20 years, your parents' names. These are data brokerage sites that sell your information. I use them to be able to hack you. Criminals do too. Highly recommend removing your information from these data brokerage sites. You can do it manually, or you can pay a service to do it for you. I, this is not sponsored content. They don't pay me to say this. They just do a good job. Uh, the name of the company is Abine, and the name of the service is Delete Me. They will remove your information quarterly from these sites so that I can't find it really easily and hack you, which is what you want. So now we're going to roll the footage. I'm going to show you exactly what it looks like when I'm hacking. And I want you to keep in your mind, I want you to first think about what principles of persuasion am I noticing in this video? They're pretty much all in there, so you can't really get it wrong. And then I want you to think about what pretexts you're noticing. So who am I pretending to be? There's one that's extremely obvious, you'll get it immediately, and there's one that's not so obvious. So here we go, let's roll the footage. You have stolen about two and a half thousand dollars worth of hotel points. And worst of all, you have put me in a middle seat. On a five hour flight. Oh my God. And they just let you do it. Yeah. Damn. So I am here in Las Vegas for two of the world's biggest hacking conferences. And for some reason, I have agreed to be hacked. I'm meeting Rachel Toback, who specializes in a special form of hacking called social engineering. And I'm very nervous. I feel like I know pretty much everything about you. I instantly don't trust you. So am I gonna be safer today, thanks to you? You and every other customer will be safer today, thanks to what you're willing to let me do. Well, let's get started, I guess. Okay, so you want to assume that everything that you put on social media is public. Information that can be found in places like this can be used to authenticate you with different companies. Do you remember this tweet? Yeah. I used this to gain access to your current address. What? So what I did is I called up this furniture company right here, and I basically said, hey, we're gonna buy another one of these pieces of furniture, but I need to make sure that I don't accidentally have the wrong information on the account. And they said, no, I mean, you ordered something a while ago, but the thing that you ordered, we shipped to this address. And yeah, I, I think I got his updated address, which is pretty scary, because that happened in 30 seconds. I got your current address. I got your birthday from Twitter. I called like pretty much every business that he ever listed that he used on his Twitter or Instagram. What you have to understand is when you do that, I now know which companies you use, and I know which companies to call as you. What did you get from the boutique hotel? Your phone number and your email address. They gave you my phone number. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to be doing these phone calls. I'm going to be actually live hacking. So when I call, your phone number is going to display on their caller ID. This is Joni O'Sullivan. Who are you really? <laughs> No, this is, this is Donia Sullivan. I can tell you my address, phone number, date of birth. Whatever you need to know to verify that, that that's really me. That's wild. I am on the road right now, and I'm having trouble getting access to my internet, but I need to transfer points to my friend for a bridal shower. Hopefully you can help me out over the phone. I have all the information. I have 90,000, is that correct? So the first and last name is Rachel Toback. Oh, they've been transferred? Okay, fantastic. They're gone. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Are your points gone? They're gone. That is crazy. When you call this airline, 
It's going to be coming from my number. Yes. As you know, I have a flight leaving Vegas. I'll put you in the middle. I'm trying to do this like personal essay thing. So can you move me to a middle seat kind of in the back of the plane? I know you probably don't get that request a lot. Oh, perfect. Okay, so it's a row right before the last row and it's in the middle seat. You're in the back of the plane, middle seat. <laughs> I had an exit aisle. I know. He picked it up saying, Mr. O'Sullivan, how can I help you? If I was not sitting here with you and didn't know, they said, well, sir, you called up and requested this, I would flip the <laughs> out. <laughs> I think we all would. Okay, so this is the interactive portion of today. Dust it off, get ready. Which principles of persuasion did you notice? This is the prize that you will receive a challenge coin. Ooh, ah, saying social engineering champion. So again, it's very hard to get this wrong. They're pretty much all in there. Call out a principle of persuasion that you noticed in that video. What did you notice? I used to be a high school teacher, so I can stand here pretty much all day. It's a big part of my experience. Yes, scarcity. Come on down. You're getting one right now. They're kind of heavy, so I'm not going to toss them at people's heads. What else? What other principles of persuasion did you see? Urgency. Absolutely. I'm not going to chuck this at you. I'm just going to put it right down here, and then you can get it. Yeah. Anything else? Did you notice the tricky pretext that I used? So one, very obvious, I'm pretending to be Doni, of course. The second one, did you pick up on what that is? What? The person yes, okay, so I was pretending to be Doni's fictitious wife, Maddie, who doesn't exist. I used that when I was contacting the furniture company. Very tricky and it's very kind of subtle in there. I've got one more challenge coin, we're gonna save it for the Q&A. So let's jump into it. The principles of persuasion that I used during that video. My favorite one is social proof. I was spoofing Doni's phone number and I had a voice changer to make it sound like I was calling as him. Just changing the pitch in many cases while you're spoofing the phone number is enough. And I had the knowledge of a previous purchase from social media to be able to gain access through a knowledge-based authentication system. So a lot of times over customer support, I'm sure you've realized, they ask you for things like your date of birth, your address, your phone number. And a lot of times you can social proof your way through that stuff just by finding things on social media. Then we had liking. I commiserated with the person on the other end of the line for the airline. I said, I know you don't get this request a lot. To move to a middle seat in the back of the plane from an aisle seat in an exit row. It doesn't happen. And the person on the other end of the line was like, I'm gonna be honest with you, sir. I've worked here for 25 years. No one has ever asked me for that type of seat change. And you gave me a reason, but I still feel like you're trolling me. And we continue to talk and build rapport. And if you can build rapport and liking enough, they'll fulfill the request. Unless you have multi-factor authentication instead of knowledge-based authentication, MFA over KBA. I'm not gonna go on a huge rant, but you get my tirade. Then we have authority. Something really sneaky that I do for the principle of persuasion of authority is I make, I make a knowingly false statement on purpose to get corrected. So I said, hey, this is Donio Sullivan. I have 75,000 points, is that correct? And they said, oh, no, sir, you have 50,000 points. Is that okay? And I said, oh, not a problem, we're good. Hung up, called back. Hey, this is Donio Sullivan, I have 50,000 points. They said, great. We verified your identity, both with that knowledge-based authentic authentication question that you preemptively answered, and with your caller ID, which I was spoofing, of course. Then for urgency, all I had to really say is, I'm trying to get these points to my friend for a bridal shower, and that was enough. It's not that urgent, but it worked. And so when I'm going through this process, I bet a lot of you are thinking in your mind, what do we do about it? Like, what do I personally do about it to keep myself safe? So the first thing is this phrase that I use called being politely paranoid. And that's just a fancy way of saying use two methods of communication to confirm people are who they say they are. We talked about that a lot in the panel that we just saw prior to me. Out of band requests is another way to say it. If you use out of band requests, be politely paranoid methodology, so to speak, you're going to catch me nine times out of 10 because it's impossible for me to cover every single base at once. I have not hacked your email and your phone and your Slack and your signal. 
I haven't done everything all at once, unless I'm a nation state actor, which I'm not, obviously. And if you're thinking about yourself personally, I recommend that you remove the services that you use from your social media because then I don't know who to contact on your behalf. Make it obnoxious for me. I don't know which airline you typically use. I don't know what has the most points. It's going to be annoying for me to contact one of them and another one and another one. And while you wait for companies to move out of the dark ages of phone call authentication, which, by the way, they are in. Can you imagine if you could log into your Gmail or your bank with your current address and date of birth? No. But that's how it works over the phone. While you wait for companies to move out of the dark ages of phone call authentication with customer support flows, I highly recommend you remove the services you use from social media. It's very, very useful. So now it's time to get into our top phishing trends. So let's talk about what we're seeing in the wild. We're going to talk about what we're also seeing in the contest. And then we'll talk about the winners. So the most common attacks continue to fall into these categories. Tech support scams. Who here has received a call of somebody pretending to be from Apple, Microsoft, Dell, Geek Squad? Yes, pretty much everybody at this point. If you haven't, you will. This is the thing that I want to make sure you understand your parents, the folks in your community know about, because this is a thing that I'm having to remediate in my personal life with folks way more frequently than a lot of the others. People fall for this one. Somebody calls them up and says, hey, I'm with Apple. You have a virus on your computer. Let me go ahead and help you take that off. They're going to use some sort of software that you download, get remote access, boom, you know, they got in. Or they're even going to say, just hold up a checkbook to your computer. Let me go ahead and, and see that. And uh, can you wire me this amount of money? It's so obnoxious. They take advantage of people. Can't stand it. Next one is shipping scams. I was about to do this talk, and somebody just messaged me on Twitter. I just got a shipping scam from DHL. I just got a phishing scam from FedEx. It's something that we're going to see pretty much every day. It's one of those spray and pray attacks. They're going to send it out to 10,000 people. Just hope somebody clicks. Government impersonation. Who's received an email? Someone pretending to be from the IRS or an, a voicemail. Yes. Constant. It's just constant. We receive it in multiple languages. They are really going out of their way to be inclusive with this one, right? You might be thinking to yourself, who's falling for this stuff? I get these all the time. I'm here to tell you, if you're receiving it, someone's falling for it. They only do it because it works. So we have to let the folks in our community know how to stay safe. Bank impersonation. We see it a lot over the phone, loss prevention calls, email. We're also seeing it a lot over text message right now. So it used to be that you get an email. Now it's like, hey, uh, this amount was spent in Florida. Is that you? No? Call this number, attacker controlled, and let's go ahead and take care of that for you. They then siphon out all the information that's used for KBA, knowledge-based authentication, for the bank on your behalf. So they basically do account takeover by contacting you and the bank and working as an intermediary. Annoying. It works. Then we have gift card scams. Someone pretending to be an exec at your company asking, hey, we need... $50 to Amazon three times for three different clients. Go ahead and scratch off the back and send it to me. Again, we joke because it's so common and we don't think we'd fall for it, but this works. I know people every single day who contacted me and say, I fell for this. What do I do? And it's like, there's not a lot you can do. You're out that money. I'm so sorry. I can't remediate that for you. So it's really about making sure folks understand it and you have the email security tools to catch it. And then, of course, we have BEC, business email compromise. Kind of think about it in practice, like coworker impersonation. That's functionally what I'm doing when I'm doing BEC. And it's extremely effective for folks in customer support and finance. And something that's really interesting that we found recently is this brand new research from Proofpoint's 2022 State of the Fish report. They found that 69% of the organizations that were the recipient of a vishing, a phone attack call, and they found that they would click on the phishing campaign much more frequently if they combined both the phishing attack and the email campaign. So this is something that we're seeing that's new. I've been doing this in practice for a while, not quite knowing if criminals were doing it, but it was effective in my pen test. So I was like, hey, you need to know how this works. The criminals have caught up. This is what they're doing now. And it's extremely effective in the case of social engineering. And this is something that we're seeing happening in the news. You might have remembered July 2020, the Twitter hack. 
Who saw Elon Musk's account, former President Barack Obama? At the, you know, at that time, we, there was like Kanye West and all those different folks are tweeting out what looks to be a crypto scam. People are asking themselves, do they all have no MFA on their account? Are all their passwords reused and found in dumps and credential stuff? Like, what's going on? But I was thinking to myself, you know what? I think this was an admin, admin panel attack. Why did I think that? Because that's how I try and gain access when I'm hacking a company. So let's break it down, what happened. So we know in July of 2020, attackers sent out messages like this. Of course, I've blocked off the actual crypto scam. I think they made out with some $180,000 or something like that. Lucrative, but not that lucrative, I mean, to make that big of a splash. And this type of attack happened, of course, because they got access to the admin panel. So how did they do it? What did it look like functionally when they were going in and attacking? So the first stage in this attack when they were hacking is they had to do their research. What worries, annoys, or frustrates people at this target company? What am I going to talk about? What am I going to name drop? Then what they had to figure out is how they're going to spoof. What's it going to look like? What phone number are they going to use? What name? What's it going to sound like to the person on the other end of the line? So they had to change their caller ID to look like it's from Twitter and build a lookalike website that they would use to change your password and siphon out the multi-factor authentication code. Because their MFA did not match their threat model, these folks who have admin access, they need a YubiKey. They need like a hardware key because I can siphon out any code from you. And then they put it all together and they tricked. They called customer support, pretending to be IT support, and they said, hey, you, you got some uh, work from home VPN issues which of course they found on Reddit or whatever other site online. Let me go ahead and help you out. All you gotta do is you gotta change your password and I can get everything set up for you. So it'll work while you're working from home. And people are so stressed out at the very beginning of the pandemic trying to tr transition to being at home that of course folks aren't using that second method of communication. And they fell for it. They were able to siphon out the password in real time, request a multi-factor authentication code and gain access to the admin panel. So what do we do about it? I've said it before and I'll say it again. Be politely paranoid. Can you imagine if these folks had called up Allison from IT who was calling them or texted them or signal messaged them, slacked, talked to them over DM. Hey, I just got a call from you. I wanna make sure that everything's all set up before I go through it. And that person's like, I didn't call you. I didn't email you. That's crazy. And can we imagine if we had these protocols set up for people so that they can actually know okay, it's not gonna be awkward when I talk to them and try and figure out if it's legit or not. They're not gonna be thinking I'm rude. It's a normal part of our everyday culture. And we have to have best practices upgraded, like limiting admin access. We know they reported it to Bloomberg that 1,500 out of 5,000 Twitter employees and contractors had the level of access necessary to make the changes during the attack. It's a huge attack surface. If I can call or email 1,500 people to get admin access, that's my lucky day, right? I'm just gonna keep calling until I get it. So we have to limit that attack surface. Detect abnormal actions with good security tools. And we have to have something like two-person sign-off. If former President Barack Obama is having trouble with his account on Twitter, it shouldn't be just one person that's helping him change his password or change his email. It's gotta be two, or even more. And we should upgrade our multi-factor authentication to match our threat model. If you have admin access, if you're in the public eye, if you're an exec, you need to move towards hardware multi-factor authentication rather than app-based or SMS. It's just way easier for me to siphon and trick. So let's get into our Armor Blocks Fishing Contest trends and winners. Here are the trends that we saw throughout the contest. You wanna come up here, Brian? Okay, let's come up, let's talk about it. So we saw a lot of super, super good emails that people uh, threw into our, uh, our form here. And so, do you wanna say something before we move on? No, we definitely saw some good yeah. attacks, and I yeah. think it's even better we saw from the panel before, we saw some good uh, precursors in that panel, the things they're talking about, we the did. things that we saw that Cued us people up. put into us, right? So they set us up for the win here. They truly did. So one of the big things that we saw is tax spoofing and payroll and HR spoofing. We're seeing a lot of people who are pretending to be internal with some sort of financial gain, right? We saw a lot of social media spoofs. Hey, you're losing access to your account, right? right. I think that was some of the things- Ge that really Generating liked. scarcity. You're gonna lose it now and exactly. how are you gonna get back to it quickly, right? So exactly. good thing to see 
you know, that being used as a technique, right? Yes, you have 24 hours, your account's locked out. Things like class action settlement spoofs, that was actually one of the weekly winners that we saw. People pretending to be the normal emails that you get and saying, hey, go ahead and click here to, to submit your information. Be, be part of the next Apple class action lawsuit, right? Yes. It was misused here, click here. Click here. Get, get free money, right? Yeah. Everybody wants to click that link. And the scary part is that this is what we typically receive when it's actually real. So how are we supposed to know when it's not, right? Um, we also saw a lot of Microsoft email delivery failure emails. So the common stuff that you're going to get bounce back emails for. Hey, you have this number of emails quarantined or something like that. We also saw requesting board level access, medical records transfer, gaining access to documents that they shouldn't have access to. It was definitely good to see the medical records transfer. I mean, yeah. As we all know, medical records are some of the most expensive records on the black market to get a hold of, right? So it was a good, good attack vector. Super good attack vector. Scary stuff. So now I want to announce the first winner. So here we have the first winner, the grand prize winner for the trickiest general phishing pretext. Would you like to read out what we have here? We have trickiest general phishing pretext at shiny underscore buttons. Woo! Ooh. Congratulations, shiny buttons. This one was a payroll ADP notification administrator email. So just high level, your new direct deposit account has been successfully modified. Your next payment will be deposited into the new account. Payment, the pay statement has been changed, et cetera, et cetera. And, totally terrifying. Right, and one of the great things about this is the attack was on a general email alias. Right. went to multiple people. So we've been talking about one-to-one -one parity with email addresses. This is a one-to-many. Right. It's even better for people like you. Yeah. You just have to send one, and there's maybe hundreds of people behind that one email address getting attacked. Exactly, which is really useful for me. And then we have the next winner. Can we get a drum roll, please, for this one? This is the next winner. We have the most convincing role-based Spearfish winner is Ross G. And Ross is actually online right now. I know that because he messaged me. Hello. <laughs> you have won $500. <laughs> so Ross's grand prize winning role-based Spearfish is subject. Can you open this link to HR at the company from the executive with a lookalike email account? Hey team, I'm traveling. I need to make sure our board can access the info by, in the deck by tonight. Can you just let me know if you can op open this link and see the presentation? Thanks, Michael. Casual. Cannot be a more real to life right. email. You know, it seems casual. Exactly. Seems quick, has a little spontaneity to it. Right? Yep. May even be tied with a you know, board meeting coming up, something that's easy to find out for a public company. Exactly, and you wanna keep it casual with some of these things because a lot of times your execs are not gonna spend 40 minutes writing an email, right? It's short, hey, share me on this thing. So congratulations to Ross and Shiny Buttons for winning $500 and all of our other weekly winners with Armor Blocks. It was awesome. Round of applause to everybody. Congratulations. Woohoo! And I'm gonna wrap it up here. Right. And then we can we wanna maybe come back up for Q&A if we have some time? Sure, absolutely. Okay, that sounds good. So we're wrapping it up here with our phishing mitigation recommendations. What do we do about it? How do we stay safe? So there's a lot of different things that people talk about with staying safe. We heard it in our panel. I'm gonna recap it here again today. But we have to make sure that we're using both the human element and the technical security tools. Because even if humans are trained, and that's what I do every single day, they can still make mistakes. Humans are fallible, they need technical backups. So we have to be politely paranoid and use two methods of communication to confirm that people are who they say they are before giving access, wiring $100,000, et cetera. And we need the technical tools to back people up in case they make mistakes, like a password manager to avoid password reuse, which is one of the easiest ways for me to hack you. Good multi-factor authentication that matches your threat model. That's the hard part. We need good patching so I can't exploit a known vulnerability on your machine. Good spam filtering, block lists, email security tools. And we have to limit admin access so you don't have a huge attack surface. And I can contact 1,500 people at your company to get admin access with those creds. And we have to work on our work machine and do personal stuff on our personal machine. You will, not, you will be extremely surprised the amount of times that I can hack a company through the personal emails of the folks that work at that company. Because I got the Gmail up there, and I can use a whole host of other pretexts that are way easier for me to use with a personal attack than a work attack. Because with work, you just contact a coworker and say, is this legit or not? With personal, they're like, coupon to H&M, I'm in, right? Much, much easier to attack. So all this to say, these times are extremely hard, but hopefully the steps we've talked about today make cybercrime at least a little bit harder.
And if you're a nerd like me and you want to read about all the sources that I've talked about today, please do take a screenshot, picture, whatever works for you. And I think we have like maybe a minute for Q&A if we have a few questions. What do you want to know about? We have a question right here. If it might come into you. What do you think about automating? So how much time do you spend, like in an example with that reporter, right? Yeah. How many person hours are spent calling all these companies, digging through their social medias, doing this work, right? That is a significant amount of effort. Yeah. And in the age of AI, we know that there are all sorts of tools that are now automating very complex tasks. And so the automation of that at scale and what do you think that's capable of and where are we? Yeah, I actually tend to do a lot of this by hand because I like doing the OSINT, the open source intelligence combing through social media. There are so many open source intelligence OSINT tools that use AI and comb through it for you. I believe that we will see AI start to make those phone calls on our behalf as attackers in the next couple of years. That's something that is particularly terrifying to me because you can say, if you see the following pieces of information on OSINT, which airline they use, which hotel they use, uh, what their email address is, then create the following pretexts, something related to HR, something related to their airline miles expiring, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then that can just be fired off based on that pretext in OSINT. That's not what I'm doing. I'm sure other attackers do it. I tend to do it by hand. And you ask me how many hours it takes, it's different for everybody, depending on how much information you have online. Typically, it'll take me like five to 10 minutes to write one pretext, like a couple hours to write many. And if I really wanna dig deep and I have to steal a lot of money from you and show that to you, uh, then that's gonna take me like a week or so. Hopefully that's helpful, yeah. I think we are out of time for the rest of questions, but thank you so much for listening and uh, hopefully you learned a little bit from a hacker. <laughs>